My name is Peter. I'm going to talk about BuildRoot and uh, a little bit about what it is and what is new in there. Maybe first of all, who has ever used BuildRoot? Just about everyone, okay. That means <coughs> the first few slides will probably be a little bit boring, but uh, here goes anyway. Well, BuildRoot is, as you apparently almost all know, an embedded Linux system, so something that builds uh, your cross tool chain, your bootloader, your Linux kernel, and a root file system. No special thing there. And um, we, of course, not the only build system, like we also heard this morning. There's all these other things Yop2, OpenBricks, uh, OpenWT, uh, Gen2, BaseRock, T2, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, but there might be a reason to use build root instead of some of these other ones. Um, one of the reasons is simply that it's one of the older system, if not the older system, um, which means it's quite mature and I think our documentation is <coughs> fairly, fairly okay. Um, another nice thing about it is that it's, it's fairly simple. Uh, Kevin Hellman, uh, recently said <coughs> this quote here that I think is nice um, because it's it's the kind of thing that I hear sometimes um, that certain other systems are fairly complicated to get started with and, and that's that's a focus of build root to make things quite easy to to use and nice thing about build root compared to at least some other system is also that we um, we do very regular time-based releases. <coughs> we do releases every three months, um, and then bug fix releases if if needed. So that means that uh, you'll get regular updates, and you you know when to expect uh, a new version to come out. It's also a real community project. But this I mean that it's there's no single company deciding <coughs> what should this thing be and what should it move in uh, towards? Um, it's just a bunch of people that that use uh, build root that move it in the direction that they now want to move it in. And the community is quite active and friendly to get started with, if I may say so myself at least. Um, now, if you do embedded build systems, then there's a lot of trade-offs involved. Um, there's all kinds of features you can think of um, that you might want to add. Uh, unfortunately, features tend to add complexity to the system. And in general, build root is on the <coughs> trying to stay on the side of being simple to use, simple to understand, but maybe doesn't have all features. Um, we also try to look at whenever a person comes with uh, a certain use case that they don't see exactly uh, how to do certain things in build root. We try to take a step back and see if maybe that special use case and that special use case is actually, you can actually solve them in general if you, if you do something more generic. I um, think that's important to do because otherwise, after a few years, you have a system with all these special features and yeah, if I want to use it like this, it works like that and at the end you cannot you cannot understand how it's supposed to work anymore. Um, because of this, these choices about simplicity means that in build root we generate one root file system. We don't generate uh, binary packages that you can install afterwards. So when whenever you say I want to make make a system with build root, you really have to say, okay, it's it's for this kind of process, or it's these kind of packages I want, and this is exactly what my system should be. And if you want to have something else, okay, you you start a new build and you you configure it differently. Some might say this is an advantage, some might say it's a disadvantage. It depends on, on what you want to do. But having runtime packages do add quite some complexity in making sure that things still work together and that everything uh, is up to date. So we don't support that. Okay, well, how does build root work? Uh, there's basically two steps to it. We have a um, configuration step where you go and say, okay, yeah, 
I have this kind of system, I want these kind of packages, I want these kind of file systems generated. And for that we use gateconfig that you all know from, from uh, the Linux kernel. In there you have a tree-based structure, you can go and say, okay, I want to look at my target packages and I might want to go down to libraries and maybe graphics libraries and okay, <coughs> I want lib PNG enabled or whatever you want to do. Uh, you also have on options, you have dependencies. So maybe uh, in order to have some graphical program, you might need to pull in uh, Qt or libgtk or whatever you, that might be. You can also have conflicts. Certain things are not available if you do something else. So you need to make sure you have, let's say, a tool chain with C++ support before you can do, you can use a program written in C++, those kind of things are in there. And finally, the options have help text. So you can go and say, oh, I don't really know what this thing is. Maybe if I do help, I'll get some more information about it. <coughs> but finally, once you've gone through all of these things, and you said, this is what my system has to be, you save it, and it writes out that .config, exactly like the Linux kernel. So that's just a text file saying option one is on, option two is on, and so on, and so on. And then you need to build it. And building it is just running make, exactly like all kinds of other systems. And that's all this to building a system with builder. The nice thing about these things is that both of those technologies are technologies that you'll encounter anyway when you do embedded Linux systems. So it's hard to get around not ever configuring a Linux kernel. So menu config is something you need to figure out to use anyway. And building any software without using make is also pretty difficult. And of course, none of these technologies are specific to build root, so you had them already. Good. Um, build root is very much structured around packages. What is a package? It's, it's a piece of your system. And each package has a number of steps that you need to do in order to to have them built and part of your root file system. This means that there's a download step, there's a step to extract what you have downloaded, there's a step to maybe add some patches. You need to configure it, you need to build it, and you need to install it. That's what a package does. <coughs> um, and then the builds, so a build root configuration is simply handling all these steps for all the packages that are enabled in the correct order, of course. If you have a program that needs a certain library, you need to do the <coughs> library before you do the program. That makes sense. So you can see build root as kind of a, a meta build system, something that will go and download the source code and the build systems of each of these individual packages and direct the build systems of these individual packages in order to make sure they get built and installed. From high above, this is this is what build root is about. If we down, go down and look at what is what is a package, uh, a package is two parts. It's a kconfig file called config.in, where you have options, at least one option for a package, do we want the package or not? But you could also imagine some kind of package with sub-options. Do you want that feature enabled or do you want that thing enabled? <coughs> These look something like this. This is, this is a real package in Buildroot for gzip. Everyone uses gzip often. Um, so what does it contain? Well, it contains a line saying config with some symbol. In this case, <coughs> gzip. All these packages have a prefix called br2 package. That's mainly historical. Then you have a line saying what should be shown in your men menu config, in this case, gzip. Finally, you can, uh, then you can have uh, some dependencies. In this case, you can only build gzip if your toolchain has white character support. So you need that. And if you don't have it, then a comment will be displayed in that, that you need white character support in your toolchain. 
And in the middle, there's some help text with a link to the, um, to the home page of that project. So you can always go there and hopefully learn some more about what the thing does. So that's part one. But you also need uh, part two, which is a make file snippet called name of package, so in this case gzip.mk. And in there you need to list these build steps, and you also need to list information about what version is it of the package and where do you find the source code. Now, if you, the package that you add is using its completely custom build system, then you need to uh, explicitly say what does it mean to uh, configure for, for this kind of uh, this package, what does it mean to build, what does it mean to install it. But if you are in the happy case of uh, having a package that uses something a bit more standard, like auto tools or CMake, then we already have some classes or some uh, support for these packages because you always configure and, and build and install the same way for all auto tools packages. So if you have that, then you can just say this one uses auto tools and the defaults will well, be correct for you. You might need to say, ah, I need to add a specific configure option or whatever that needs to be in there. But in general, the defaults will, will do the right thing. Now, GZIP uses auto tools. So it's very easy. You just have to say, I want to use GZIP version 1.6. The tarball is called gzip 1.6.tar.exe. And you find it in the local GNU mirror in the gzip subdirectory. That's very easy. And because it's auto tools, <laughs> you have to say it's an auto tools package. Could also be a generic package. Then you have to say all these build steps, or it could be a CMake package. Very simple, very small. Um, so that's for your package. You also need to integrate it into BuildRoot so BuildRoot can find it. You need to say where should it be in the menu. Is it a library? Is it, is it an utility or something related to network or what is it? Um, so that's the next part. The packages are all on the package and there's a kconfig file that says everything on the package is, is in here. So you need to open that one up, find where you want to put it and add your include. So somewhere, I put, in this case, it's on the compressors and decompressors. Kind of makes sense for gzip. There's an include line saying, include the config in file from gzip. OK. Very simple. If you then run menu config, go under the packages, go under the compressors and decompressors, you see something like this, gzip can enable it if you want to and <coughs> if you then run make you will build gzip. <coughs> Very easy to use. Good. That's using build root but as most of you had your hands up before you all know this thing. Good. Um, what you may or may not know is uh, the way we handle the source code. First of all we use git and we use it in the same way as the Linux kernel is maintained. Um, with that I mean there's only one person having commit access, that person being me. Um, and the way development happens is po patches get posted to our mailing list, it gets reviewed and finally I commit it. Exactly the same as getting a change into the Linux kernel. We have something like uh, two, three hundred patches that gets added to the tree per month and we use patchwork. Again, very similar to a lot of sys subsystem in, in the Linux kernel. Patchwork is a, a web-based tool. Um, Wolfgang Sang already talked about it yesterday, but for the ones that didn't saw his presentation, it's, it's something that is subscribed to the mailing list, keeps track on everything on the mailing list that looks like a, a patch, and it adds it in, in this overview. What it also does is, uh, whenever people comment on a, on a patch, it gets uh, added on that page. And whenever you add these tags that you also have in the Linux kernel about 
this is act by a certain person. These things get all added. And I can then, when I want to then apply a patch, I can, this is my to-do list, basically, of patches I need to look at. I can take it in, I can put it from there, I get automatically all the people that agreed on this patch, and I can add it to the Git repository. That's basically the workflow that, that we use for that. All of it happens on the mailing list. So this mailing list is um, pretty active, and the activity has been growing over the years. So we have something like 1,000 people, more or less, uh, subscribed to the mailing list, and we have something like 2,000 mails a month, something like that. Um, when I started using Buildroot, which was, which was yeah, around here, somewhere, 2006, it was more like yeah, a few emails a day, two, three emails a day, something like that. So things are changing. Also, the number of contributors, so the people that add, uh, so, uh, contribute patches these months, have been growing quite a bit. And now we are up to something like yeah, 30, 40 changes a bit from month to month, but in that order of a scale of people uh, submitting patches. Next to the discussion on the mailing list, we also have an ISC channel, but we do meet up two times a year. Normally these things are aligned with uh, conferences because people are together anyway, so we have one in, in February at Fostem and we have one around ELC on the next weekend. We're going to have one where we meet up face to face. We're normally, well, the group of, let's say, core developers in somewhere between five and, and ten people. Um, and we discuss various things that are sometimes difficult to discuss on, on emails. If you are a, a user of Buildroot and you're interested in participating in, in the development of this, you're also welcome to join these kind of developer days. Locally, we have uh, companies that um, <coughs> sponsor these events because there's top, typically some kind of expenses involved with finding a place to have these meetings and uh, setting things up for that. And uh, I would like to take the opportunity to thank these companies that have been sponsoring us so far. Yeah, we had Free Electrons, uh, Imagination Technologies, Google, Synopsis, Florenzo, uh, Kaleo systems have sponsored. That's very nice. <coughs> if you look at what companies are using Buildroot, it's of course a bit difficult because in general people don't tell us about these things. So um, there's presumably a lot of companies that are not on this list, but a few companies <coughs> I can mention is Baku, where I'm working. Where we're using it in the projects that I'm working on. Um, not a very well-known company is, is Google that is using it for their fiber boxes in, in America. Uh, Rock and Collins have recently started uh, submitting patches for us, so they are also using it. Um, and various SOC vendors are using it in, in, their, uh, in their software delivery to, the, to their customers. Atmel is one, uh, um, Imagination Technologies, Synopsis, and so on and so on. Good. That's a bit of what built with this. If you now look at what is new, then one of the new things that have been added within the last year, year and a half is. Uh, a number of new architectures. Uh, the 64-bit version of uh, ARM and uh, these, let's say, a bit more special architectures uh, like uh, Synopsis uh, Arc, Blackfin, Microblaze, NIOS 2, uh, Extensa. The nice thing, or the interesting thing is the work on adding Blackfin and Arc and Extensa was actually done by the, the companies. 
making these uh, chip architectures. So that's nice. And we have also improved the uh, variant support we have. Well, that's this I particularly mean uh, the support on ARM. For a number of years, basically, what we supported was uh, software floating point on ARM. But ARM is has a lot of variation <laughs> and um, uh, versions of uh, the hardware floating point support. If it has neon uh, support or not. Um, and by now you can you can choose between software floating point, you can choose between the hardware floating point, but uh, <coughs> passing it in in the integer registers or the hard FP support. So that's uh, nice to make advantage of uh, of these features if your processors have them. We also have improved the uh, no MMU support, for instance, in, in relation to to Blackfin, for instance. Um, what we've done is that we have uh, annotated a bunch of packages because not all packages works when you don't have uh, an MMU. You cannot do the normal fork. So uh, these packages, just like for the toolchain options about this package, you need uh, C++ support in your toolchain. It will say, yeah, that this package is, is not available and it's it's not present in, in menu config. The same about the file format that you generate for these uh, no MMU uh, uh, systems. Good, that's architecture. Tool chains, that thing should I'll add them right away. Um, for a number of years, <coughs> uh, Buildroot only did uslibc, and the reason for that was mainly that Originally, it was created to test and, and demo user libc. And that's not the case anymore. We can build tool chains with uh, eglibc and glibc, as well as user libc. And you also have the options of not always building your own tool chain. You can also use an external tool chain that you might have already from your SOC vendor, or you can maybe use some of these popular ones like the Codebenz ones or the Linero tool chains. You can provide a complete, you can say I use a complete custom one and you have to say where to find it. But we also have uh, pre-configured the popular Linaro tool chains and the code bins ones so you can just go and select them. It's very easy. Very recently we have been uh, working on adding uh, support for the uh, Musil uh, C library as well as an alternative to glibc and uslibc. <coughs> We have also added a lot of new packages <coughs> lately. Now, I started being maintainer in 2009, and honestly, Buildroot at that time had been without maintainer for a number of years, so we did spend quite a lot of time on cleaning up stuff. That took a while, but let's say the last two years or something like that, from around here, we really started adding a lot of new patches and uh, uh, packages. So within the, the last 12 months, we have added something like 30% more. And now we add yeah, 1,100 packages, something like that. So that's nice. What kind of packages have we been adding lately? Well, uh, a bunch of multimedia stuff, mainly. GStreamer 1.2, Wayland, uh, EFL, Qt5, Pulse Audio, Opus, uh, Linphone, uh, TV Headend, and so on and so on. Um, we also have Python 3 by now, uh, Node.js. Um, we have Flashburns, we have Systemd. Um, we also added quite some uh, development tools that are sometimes quite interesting, like uh, Perf, LCT, NG, uh, Trace Command, Wireshark. Um, <laughs> That are sometimes indeed uh, stuff that you that can be interesting to have on your target. Um, some of this stuff, the multimedia stuff, was done in uh, context of uh, Google Summer of Code, where we this year had a student, Spencer, with uh, Thomas as as mentor, and Spencer was working on adding support for all these. complicated packages for um, 
SOC specific hardware acceleration, so for the GPUs and for the video acceleration. Um, and he added support for the GPU drivers on the TI components, the Mali in, on Alwina, the GPU on the IMX series, uh, IMX6 in this case, and the Raspberry Pi support. And similar for the video acceleration, it was also Alwina, the IMX, and the uh, Raspberry Pi. So this means if, you, if you're using any of these uh, SOCs, uh, the hardware acceleration support looks a lot nicer than it used to be. And the way these things have been added means that uh, it's quite easy to add new variants now. Because there's a concept of multiple drivers that can provide, for instance, OpenGL ES support. And the, the rest of the packages that have <coughs> OpenGL ES support knows how to work with these different packages. Good. The way we do quality insurance is, well, basically, when you have an embedded build system or a build system of any of these kind of situations, uh, if you have a thousand packages with a number of sub-options, number of architectures with all kinds of sub-options as well, um, the question comes, how do you actually, how do you do any QA on this? How do you test these things? If you just look at the m number of combinations, it's, you cannot, cannot really do this in any any structured way. So the way we do it is that we um, do uh, random configurations, just again and again, that kind of architecture, that kind of sub-options, with this kind of packages, with option A on, option B off, and so on. And we build all the time. And with that, you catch a lot of corner cases about on this particular tool chain, this particular option. If that is enabled, then this thing doesn't work. We do that on uh, a number of servers, and there's a website you can go to that provides an overview of all the build results. So um, the green things is, is good, the red things are not so good. Um, and we also generate a daily report, and we have a look at oh, this package that were upgraded yesterday tends to fail now on, let's say, PowerPC. Okay, let's have a look at what that is. Uh, so that's really something we use a lot when we do the development to make sure that all kinds of combinations that you will end up using will actually work. Because um, that, that could otherwise very well be a problem. The developers use this kind of system and it all seems to work and you go and download a new release and you have something a bit different and blows up in, in your head and it doesn't even build. Good. Next to that, we also uh, have split up the development cycle, so the three months. We really have two months where we do development, then I put out release candidate one, and then there's only bug fixes until the final release gets released at the end of the month. Um, and of course, if then a problem happens, then uh, then we do a bug fix release, like what we've done this time. Uh, so we have the latest release is 2013.08.1, because there were a few last minute uh, issues that were found. What we don't do here, at least, is any kind of runtime tests. Here you just check that things are building, but you don't really know if, uh, if it works. It's quite tricky to do for all these kind of combinations, and you typically need all kinds of different hardware. And so that we don't do. Uh, the hope is that people will test these release candidates and, uh, and notice things. Um, I use BuildRoot myself at work, so I tend to test it as, as it gets released, but uh, other than that, there's no real um, structured way that, that we do runtime tests. Okay, well, it's better than nothing still. Next thing that comes up with these kind of things is license compliance. Um, built with itself is GPL2, uh, and a lot of the packages that you tend to use in the system are also GPL. If nothing else, then the Linux kernel and probably BusyBox, maybe U-Boot. Um, these kind of licenses have all got, have uh, 
certain things you need to do. Um, and in general, uh, build system makes it easier for you to do all the build steps. And it would be nice if it would also make it easy for you to do this license compliance. The way we are doing it is that we have annotated our packages with the license they are. So in this case, gzip is GPL3 or any later version. And the um, license file is called copying, like for most other packages as well. And what we can do is that we have a make target called legal info that can uh, generate a manifest of saying this configuration contains of these and these and these packages. These packages are on the li license this and this and this. Um, the license files are here with sometimes more information or more details. Uh, not all packages are as simple as this. Sometimes you have this part is under that license, that part is under that. And yeah, it sometimes can get messy. But um, ha do you have a copy of the source code of these packages? Of course, that's in the case of GPL also a requirement. And you have the build root configuration. Now you have to understand that this is this is support for doing your license compliance. Cannot solve all your problems, but at least you have all the all the data that you need in a condensed form. Um, but you still need to look at it um, and see if you don't have any kind of conflicts. For instance, your proprietary applications that <coughs> links to GPL li uh, license libraries, or maybe even license conflicts in the sense of. Um, BSD with an uh, advertising clause and a GPL thing, like um, you have with OpenSSL. Those kind of things we don't we don't try to see if if there's some kind of combination that is not allowed in that in that sense. It it will become very very difficult to to do, but at least you have the base information, and you can review it or your legal department or whoever does these kind of things can do it for you. So that's also a relatively new feature we have in, in BuildRoot. We also have an Eclipse plugin for doing a development, package development uh, using your cross uh, compiler. Um, so it's something that f is, uh, makes it easy to, to find the cross tool chains you build with BuildRoot and sets it up correctly so that you build with that one, it finds the right PKT config files and so on and so on. I must say, personally, I don't use Eclipse, so I don't know a lot about it, but it's there. We have also uh, added a number of configuration files for popular boards um, make it to make it easier to get started using BuildRoot on these kind of boards. Uh, we have the BeagleBone, we have Gooby board, we have um, Nitrogen 6X, which is an IMX 6 board the Raspberry Pi, Shiva block, the WAN board, and so on. Which is nice if you have that kind of hardware, but if you don't, the QM variants are also quite nice, because you can easily build something you can run inside uh, the QM virtual machine. <coughs> I use this as well uh, for testing quite often on my, uh, on my PC. So I can easily build uh, a kernel that matches a certain QM configuration and a root file system. That can be fairly handy to get running in a fast way. Historically, everything in BuildRoot were running, was running as root, or we only had some prefix, uh, predetermined um, system users. And it's not really flexible if you have a specific package that uh, would like to run as a, a non-root user. Um, because you could come up with your own root file system skeleton and you, you wouldn't have these things in there. So we added some infrastructure that the package can say, I need to have a specific user and it has to be called this and this and this. And then uh, the init script will start up that daemon as that user. So um, you do define something like this. This is <laughs> from a package called TV Headend um, that we would like a user to be added called TV Headend. Uh, we don't really care about what user ID or what group ID it is, but okay, user should be TV headend, group should be TV headend, uh, the home directory should be that, and it should be in the video group, 
and then um, Beltwood would automatically add that to the etc password and etc group files uh, when you build. Can sometimes be handy. Good. Um, that's all kind of features. Now, if you want to use Buildroot to, to build a final system, which is presumably why you're using it in the first place, you typically want to do some kind of con uh, customization. Uh, can be small things, it can be big things. Um, and we have added a number of features to make it easier to do, to do these kind of things. There's some very simple uh, customizations that everyone wants to do. And for those, we added uh, options in the menu config for. For instance, uh, you want to set the host name or the login banner, or you want to change the root password, or um, you want to choose on what serial port should the login program run on. Those things almost always need to be changed. So we, uh, we simply add uh, menu config options for these. It's very easy to, to go and change. Sometimes that's not really enough. You might want to do other things. So we have a concept of uh, overlays of, of extra files you want into your file system. Um, one or more of these directories. And whatever is in there just gets added on top of the default um, uh, file system. So if you have some data files or, I don't know, images for your website or something like that, you can add them in there. That goes good if you just want to add stuff, but sometimes you want to remove stuff, or you want to change stuff, or you want to do something strange. Um, and instead of adding options for all these special things you could think of, we simply said, OK, you can run one or more scripts at the step where we have put everything into the file system, but, uh, but before we created our file system images. And that's the post-built script. So you have added all your files in there, and you say, OK, I'll uh, run a shell script in here. And you can say, oh, that file I really don't want, so I'll go and delete that, or maybe certain things should be changed. So if you just write a simple shell script that does this, you can plug it in at the right spot just before you create the uh, file system images. The other thing that people sometimes want to do is, OK, they use build root, they create a bunch of things, kernel image, uh, bootloader, root file system. But actually, in order to put them on the target, they, they need to put it together in some special way. Or maybe maybe they need to uh, create a, I don't know, partition table or to make an SD card image or something like that. Um, and in concept, <coughs> you can do all of these things outside BuildRoot because BuildRoot just generates these things. And you can do whatever you want to do with it afterwards. But if you want to... If you, if you want to put it under configuration and you want to make sure that it always gets done in the same way, you can add it in a post image script. So that's just at the very end, when BuildWood is done with its stuff, you can go and say, ah, I want to put them together to one kind of upgrade image or whatever you want to do with it. Sorry, it's only at the uh, final image level? Yes, so that's, that's two. This is when all the stuff has been added to, the, to your uh, root file system but before you create the images, so you can remove stuff or mm -hmm. change stuff. And then once the image or images has been created, when, when you have everything there, basically when make would stop otherwise, you can run one, one more script. That's called the post image script. <coughs> and of course, you can always add custom packages. You can always add your own stuff like that. That's the options we have for customization. There's a number of things in progress. Um, one of them is um, if you now do these custom packages, then at least some companies like to be able to keep them separate from BuildRoot and make it easy to upgrade to a new version of BuildRoot and, and not have co any kind of merge conflicts. So we're looking at some kind of uh, package overlay support for that. We also had some uh, support for SE Linux submitted recently that, um, that we're working on getting integrated. Um, the systemd version and udev version that we have are 
fairly old, uh, but we are working on getting that updated. And of course, anything else that gets submitted in the by people interested in, in working on it. Good. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, will you be able to mask out any uh, license uh, types? No. So, what I'm. <coughs> if I can go back. Uh, oh, yeah. One too many. What I'm saying is that. This is just to support your options. We're not going to start saying if you have enabled a certain, I don't know, uh, if you said I don't want GPL stuff, you cannot have a Linux kernel anymore. No, we're not going to do that because very fast it becomes complicated. What license is this exactly on? And it depends on how do you use it and how are these things. So we have added this just to help because Every user of, uh, of BuildWood needs to go through all of these things. I'm using that package. What license is it under? What do I need to do? Um, on the top level, they still have to see, is, is this even legal to put together like this? But OK, that's difficult for us to do. But we can at least do the, the groundwork, collect all the information in a, in a nice overview so that you can easily assess what you need to assess. <coughs> Yes, make random package config. It's a make target. So they can do it by their own? Yes. The, uh, if you go back to that, the website itself um, <coughs> and... Uh, uh, okay, I got too far. Anyway. Um, the website itself that collects all the information is something that we run and we prefer to have a bit of control over the auto builders because imagine something doesn't work on this one machine and, and it works on all other machines and we kind of figure it out then it's it's nice to understand what is special on there or try to log in on the machine yourself and, and, and look at it but in concept you c there's nothing secret about it and, and even the source code of that web application is also available in, in Git, so there's nothing special as such. I would say if you are, if you are a user of BuildRoot and you really care about specific configurations, you probably don't want to do it like this, because you have a specific configuration. This is the configuration I care about. Yeah, but you uh, yes, yes, uh, certainly, certainly. I, the way I work, we have a number of configurations that we care about, and I built those configurations to make sure that they work. But for build routes as a project, yeah, what are the configurations that are interesting? Yeah, We have uh, these dev configs for a few boards, but they're very minimal, just saying, ah, I need this kernel uh, in order to, to run on a beagle bone or whatever. So they, they don't really test a lot of things. OK. Do you have some kind of uh, caching mechanism, or is it just built from scratch if you do a well, you have uh, Ccache, but, but other than that, there's no, no caching on it. Uh, the downloads will get cached, but, but not the, the build results are not cached. So you, you build them from scratch to make sure that everything is, uh, well, there's, there's no thing leaking out. Yeah? Um, I don't remember, but uh, it's possible to uh, remove from the config one package and then have this package remove from the final image uh, when it's already yielded? No. Can no. you add the, the script from Slack where they take track of what file is installed so it's impossible to revert what is installed in the target directory? Because <laughs> Slack where has a nice things uh, that takes a target data, install it, uh, and uh, it can uh, go back in the installation. So this is nice because a lot of times they happen to me that I build, for example, some package and then I say, no, I need to remove it. And uh, so it's not, not nice. And it's very, very nice to have a target in the make file. It's some, some things that are very useful for the whole, for the whole of you. 
that the force, the removal of uh, the preconfig, so dot uh, build, uh, build build or remove the, some file that is configured or patched. Yeah. So it's easy to rebuild just one package without going the directory and remove manually some files there. Right? Yeah, that's possible. But to to be able to remove a package once you build it and have that robust, that very easily becomes quite complicated. Imagine you have selected open SSL mm -hmm. and you have a bunch of packages that you built that have optional optional open SSL support yeah, yeah. and you go and remove yeah, open yeah, SSL yeah. then you need to see all the reverse yeah, dependencies yeah, yeah. and you need to rebuild all of these yeah, things yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. so we don't do it because, yeah, because it optimizes the configuration flag uh, or depends on the package that you ever selected so if you remove something then you need to take track of what page you need to remove so it's not the only no. So indeed, if you know what you're doing, and and for certain subsets of packages, you can you can do that. I do it myself. Okay, I remove that package and I build it again. But we don't support it because we cannot support it in all the situations, and we prefer to not offer yeah. something that sometimes work but yeah, yeah. don't always yeah, work. Okay. Yeah. Well, right now, build root, the, the top level build root doesn't support parallel builds, but each step within it, imagine uh, GZIP or whatever, can build in parallel. There's some work being done now on uh, getting the top level, uh, getting some more parallelism in there, but right now there, there isn't any support. Um, it would be, be nice to have, uh, certainly, if you need to download big things and it takes a while and those kind of things, but uh, we don't have it. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, you. Well, it's something that comes up. Uh, sometimes you have two different pieces of hardware, but actually it's the same kind of software you support, or you have one piece of hardware and you have two different configurations. Right now, we don't really support it. In concepts, uh, you can do it because the .config files, they're just text files. You can just concatenate, and I say I have a base config with just the, the hardware specifics, and I have one with a set of packages, so you can just put them with cats after each other and, and it works but there's no we don't have a nice way of uh, saying if you go and then run menu config to split it up again and what belongs in one or the other we don't currently have um, any good ideas on how to how to really solve this um. <coughs> it's not that we care don't care but the question is how uh, how do you define what is what belongs to what it can be, yeah, um, what is your definition of the base system? It can be just a really hardware specific. Or you say, I always have these kind of libraries available. They also need to be in there. It's, it becomes quite tricky to to be able to define this in, in, in any way. I think it's, it's part of the, the GIS principle. We really want to keep something that there is one config, one build, one result. Yeah. And so if, if you want to do fancy things, there's nothing, the idea of BuildWood is that it provides this chain, but there's nothing that prevents you from integrating this chain in a more higher level build mechanism. And I have a number of our customers that have your situation, and what uh, we always tell them to do is uh, what Peter says, uh, do fragments of that config. So not the full that config, but we, you can generate that config with our minimal configuration files that only have the non-default uh, option values. So instead of being like several thousand lines, there are usually like tens to tens of lines. So you can manually edit them, and you can put a fragment where you define which tool chain, which hardware, which panel, which computer, and then another fragment where you define, I don't know, the base software stack, and then another fragment with the high level software stack, and then you can combine them in whichever way you want. They're just doing that, the first fragment, the second fragment, and the third fragment, you will direct that in that config, start your build. 
Well, it's, it's, and then at the end, once you have your curated dot if you want to further uh, refine it, then you can run make the UV again and then continue your work with the Yes, yes. But usually it's, um, I mean, whenever you have a package, it's really a matter of just like the VR2 package, play equal Y in a file, which isn't that difficult. The option, so uh, the order nominator. I think I think the way we w if we want to solve that problem I think the way we would solve it is the same way as we solve all this special tweaking it's common that you want to do something special but it's it's always different what you want to do so maybe we could come up with some kind of a hook before menu config make menu config and a hook afterwards and you could say oh, I'm gonna write a script that says okay I'm gonna split it out I'm gonna take these three files put them together first and another script that splits them out and it would be then project specific what this script would do but we at least have the infrastructure yes but you if you put it in a script okay I have to stop um, if you put it in, in the script at least it would be you would make sure you always do it in the same way that's basically the same about this, these hooks the reason why you want to have them in build root is just to make sure that you can always <coughs> build the same thing it's always reproducible okay we are out of time <laughs>